All right, class, this is Aaron Becker, and welcome to Lecture 8, where we're going to talk about inverse kinematics, why you need it, uh, and what you can do with that. Uh, so here is an example of, uh, this is Stanford Manipulator, and here's a video. We've, we made this in a Robotica program. Uh, the Stanford Manipulator has six joints, and so it's got a waist joint that you can rotate. Theta 2 is a rotation around the shoulder. Then there's this offset to a prismatic joint. Uh, that can slide uh, the forearm forward and backwards. And then at the end of the forearm is what's called a spherical wrist. So it's a rotation around the z-axis, the y-axis, and then followed up by a z-axis rotation. And so that allows us to reach any orientation and any position in the workspace. And so a useful robot here. And then you can also close the gripper. That's not really a degree of freedom seven, but the inverse kinematics problem is when I don't tell you where the, all the joints are, I just tell you where I want that end effector. So the forward, we move all the joints and we tell where the robot is. The inverse is, somebody says, the end effector is right here. Tell me what values I should set a theta 1 through 6 at in order to get the robot to join up with that. So the forward kinematics as a review we've got a bunch of these A matrices. Each of these A matrices is a homogeneous transform that changes from one uh, orientation in one position to another uh, position and orientation where they're completely parameterized by the joint value. And so the first one, A1, is completely parameterized by Q1, uh, whereas the last one, the nth joint, is completely par parameterized by Qn. You multiply those together and you get the total transformation matrix that takes you um, from the base frame, which is zero, into the nth frame. So we call this our homogeneous transform. But what it is is just a rotational matrix in the top left. So a three by three in a special orthogonal three. And then a translation, a three by one vector O. And so this whole matrix is in SE3, which is special Euclidean uh, of dimension 3. And so in general, this uh, matrix is going to be uh, 16 values, these T11s through T44. Uh, for the Stanford manipulator, we've got six degrees of freedom. So it's, uh, the T matrix tells you, well, what is the orientation position of the six coordinate frame in terms of the base frame? And in our Stanford manipulator, we have um, values for each of these entries in here. So the first one, T11, that is telling you where is the X frame of the end effector in terms of the X frame in the base frame. And so this is the X frame of the end effector in terms of the Y, uh, y basis vector in the base frame and then in terms of the z basis vector in that base frame. And so t11 is going to be a minus a sine times our angle of our, our base joint times a bunch of trigonometry minus uh, the cosine of that uh, base joint times a bunch of trigonometry. And so each of these entries in here are going to look like you know, these entries. You know, the first 3 by 3 matrix is a rotation matrix. So that's where we get all of our sines and cosines. Whereas the last three matri uh, entries is that translation. And so this is where you get some constants for non-zero joint offsets, so things like our R's and our D's. And then you also get you know, this D3 is how much we're translating along this axis. And so D3 here is multiplied by cosine 2, because this cosine 2 tells us how much of this is actually uh, oriented in the, the base frame's zeroth axis. So if we rotate this cosine to be oh, uh, 90 degrees, uh, then this robot is going to be parallel to the ground and gets no Z frame. And so remember, the forward kinematics, the somebody tells you what are all these joint values, and you tell them this is where your robot is. And when you do that, you calculate a transformation, this H form, in this, this is the home position for this robot where everything is at zero. And so you can see we've got, um, you know, our orientation is going to be just identity matrix. And then we've got a little bit of an offset from the base frame to the end effector. So the inverse kinematics is different because the, end effector the inverse kinematics says, hey, this is where your gripper is. 
you tell me how to arrange all the rest of the joints in order to link up our robot to our end effector. So somebody gives you the orientation and position of this um, end effector, well that is just a modulus transformation. It's a rotation of that coordinate frame and then an offset from the base frame to the origin of this coordinate frame. And so that's an element of special Euclidean 3 and your job is to figure out what are all these Q values, the joint values, Q1 through N. And so you're given this transformation function which is just a bunch of real numbers, some scalar values, and you have to figure out what is Q1 through Qn. Uh, with the understanding that you know, each of these Qs you know, is parameterizing a single of these A matrices that are all multiplied together. And so in this case, you know, the transformation is actually given over here by these uh, theta 1 through 6 and that D3 there. And so what it looks like is this. So this is the answer. You know, notice the transformation function is exactly the same when I go between these. But the question is, how did we solve that? If somebody just gives me this end effector, how do I solve for all these joints? And I want you to think about that. You know, how could you solve that? You know, it's sort of like a searching problem. You could search for the answer. Uh, you could do that numerically and try to minimize your error, you know, generating this h function as you go. And that, that's certainly one trick you could do. So mathematically, our problem is we're given a modulus transformation, some element in SE3, find the solution, the, the q1 through n values for your n degrees of freedom, such that you can replicate that h matrix. You can write that another way as saying, well, I'm trying to find the tij values. Um, and you know this isn't as hard as you know that tij is a four by this t matrix is a four by four matrix. But remember that bottom row is always going to be zero 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 one. So you only have to worry about the first three rows um, and all four columns. And there's some more constraints that that uh, first three by three matrix has to be a rotation matrix. So there are constraints that you can work with as you're solving this. So let's look at this problem. Uh, with some caveats because the inverse kinematics, the forward kinematics always has a solution. Somebody tells you some joint angles, this is where that robot is. Inverse kinematics, somebody says, I want the robot to reach over here at such and such an orientation. That may or may not have a solution. And so my example of this is trying to scratch that little spot in my back that I can't reach with either my right or my left hand. Uh, there's no way to reach it. How about for this robot? I want you to pause for a bit. Where can this robot not have a solution? All right, pause, you've thought about it. So hopefully you've said, you know, anywhere that's outside of its workspace. You know, I stretch the robot completely out. Anything beyond that I can't reach. Uh, those are definitely not out. Uh, now some other things that we can't reach are, you know, things that are outside our dexterous workspace. So remember, the dexterous workspace is where it can achieve arbitrary orientation and position. And so, you know, even if it's within the reachable space, you know, you might not be able to get all those orientations you want. Caveat number two. Even the solution exists, it may or it might not be unique. What I'm saying is that there might be multiple solutions for this. And three, because these forward kinematics, anytime you have a rotational joint, you're going to have a nonlinear forward kinematics, which means that these solutions are hard to obtain even if we know that they exist. Uh, because you've seen how these transformation matrices can be uh, looking like something that looks almost arbitrarily complex if we add joints on there. And so the first thing I want you to do, and this is a good time for you to stretch while you're watching this lecture, pretend that you're a puma arm. And I want you to think, how many solutions are you to get for this picture that's shown in here. So I want the end effector right here um, with my end effector pointed right down. How many different solutions can I arrange this Puma so that it reaches this point? And I want you to play with that. So pause your video and try to show all the possible solutions to this point. Go ahead, pause it, I'll wait for you. All right, resuming. So here are these four solutions, and they are called left arm and right arm, although this robot only has one arm, but if we, we can orient it um, so that it, the left arm, it looks like a left armed robot, or we can spin it around 180 degrees and call it a right armed robot. So for the left arm, we can either have that elbow in the up position, as we saw on the previous page, or with the elbow down, 
the right arm can also have this elbow up and elbow down. So really all we've done is we've rotated this robot around by 180 degrees and we get these four solutions. And you should be familiar with this because with your little robot uh, in your last demo you showed that you could come up with four different solutions to this kinematics problem. All right, so your goal, and you know, if you enjoy challenges, you're, think of it like this. Somebody hands you um, a rotation matrix R and an offset O, you know, which you get from this homogeneous transformation. We want to find closed form solutions of equations so that every joint is a function just of uh, some function. So I'm going to have k joints and I'll have f uh, k functions where k is equal from 1 to n that is just a function of um, all these entries from uh, 1, 1 all the way to 3, 4 in that h matrix. And I want a closed form. I don't want a numerical because what you could do is you could throw, throw this into an optimization routine and it would iterate and do some sort of gradient descent until you got within machine precision of the right answer and say, hey, I've solved the inverse kinematics goal. I don't want you to do that. Can you think of why that might be a problem? Those of you who have done some optimization or if you can think about gradient descent. So gradient descent is sort of like find the minimum of a hilly function. Why might that not be a good idea? Go ahead and pause. Think about that. All right, resuming. So why closed form? Well, first off, it's much faster because you've got just these equations that are trigonometric equations. We can push that through a computer very fast. And it has to be fast. A couple years ago, I was getting trained at Omron Automation Company. And they were showing us their industrial uh, controllers and told us that they were using a, a 1 8 millisecond control loop. So 8 times a millisecond, 8,000 times a second, they are recalculating their inverse kinematics. And so you're doing this code very often. It ought to be fast. Whereas iterative search is slow. Well, look, I've got two number ones. Well, they're both important. Iterative search is slow, meaning that uh, not only is it slow, but it also has an you know, undefined uh, um, running time. You know, sometimes it'll be faster than other times. So it's not something that I want to trust in my real-time clock uh, when I'm trying to update my control loss. And finally, these kinematics, as we just showed with that Puma arm, can have multiple solutions. And so we need a system, a way to choose this. And so I want you to imagine, take your right arm and put a pen in it and pretend that's a scalpel blade. And you've only got one arm because you're a one-armed robot, and you're cutting through somebody's rib cage, and then suddenly um, your numerical search that tells you your next uh, solution to your inverse kinematics is to switch from being a right-handed robot to a left-hand robot, and you and I know that's just a rotation of pi degrees around my waist axis. Now, with your knife in your patient, spin around 180 degrees, and you can see that is a terrible idea. You know, we need to be able to smoothly choose and be able to choose which of our multiple solutions we're going to work with. All right, so this inverse kinematics problem is in general hard. And so we are going to rely on heuristics. But heuristic is just a fancy word for a trick. We're going to come up with some tricks that are going to simplify this problem. And the first one is called kinematic decoupling, where we are going to decouple the position problem and the orientation problem. Now, the caveat is this is only possible with six joints, uh, and the last three joint axes intersect at a point. Um, and uh, the other one, and so, so this is satisfied with this example that we have right here, which is our spherical wrist. And so we said we've designed this in such a way our DH frame has our Z4, our Z3, and our Z6 are all intersecting at this, uh, actually Z3, Z4, Z5 are all intersecting at this point, which we call the wrist center. Um, and that wrist center is uh, also we call OC, because we like things that are, are simple. Uh, we've got this OC here, and uh, we have the DH parameters for that that describe what is the transformation um, from my third coordinate frame to my sixth coordinate frame. And so somebody tells me where my gripper is, I can solve where this OC position is. 
And to help this out, I've made a little robot out of Tinker Toys. And this is a robot arm that is trying to steal my wallet out of my pocket. So my wallet's at a certain orientation, which means that if this robot wants to steal my wallet, it has to move inwards so that the gripper can close around my wallet. And the gripper has a limited width, so there's only one orientation that it can approach in. And so if I say I want this robot to steal my wallet, it's got to come in at this orientation which is going to freeze the position of the last uh, of the end effector in this last link of this robot because this end effector, the fingers have to be at a position O uh, and they have to be in orient orientation R. But if you think about it, specifying the R and the O of the end effector doesn't specify where the rest of the robot is. And so I can spin the rest of this spherical wrist quite a bit and achieve any other, almost any other orientation about this point. And But as I spin this robot around, that OC is always going to be in the same place. That OC position is constant. And so in order to steal this wallet, my robot has to be at a certain R and a certain O. Um, and that's going to define where the OC is, but it doesn't define uh, the angles of joints 4, 5, and 6, which means all I have to do is figure out how to get the rest of my robot so that it touches OC, and then I can come up with my joint parameters for theta th 4, theta 5, and theta 6 in order to link up my spherical wrist with my robot. All right, so the problem is we're given this R and this O, and we want to solve for joint angles Q1 through Q6. Uh, we've got this constraint that we've got a spherical wrist where we have Z3, Z4, Z5 intersecting at the wrist center. And this wrist center now is only a function of the first three joint variables. And that's the decoupling. The OC is a function of the first three joint variables. Now the tool frame where the, orient, the end effector is origin is at O and it's a translation of D6. That's the length of my last uh, link along Z5 from the wrist center. So this is a problem that I want you to take some paper with, and I want you to solve this out. So we are given um, O, and we are given R, and we want to figure what is OC in the base frame. And so something to remember is that this D6 is the orientation of the Z axis, and so we only need to pull off the third column of our rotation matrix. So the first thing I want you to do is to solve for OC in the base frame. And then I want to plug into that solution, plug in your value for O, a specific value. It's going to be OX, OY, OZ. And then solve for what is XC, YC, and ZC. So pause your video and solve this out. And I'll work it out while you do that. All right, pausing. Resuming. So the answer that you have in order to isolate what is OC in the base frame, well, we have OC here and we just subtract our D6 times our rotation matrix and extract that uh, Z column. So I'm subtracting D6R minus my uh, end effector position and that'll solve for my OC in the Z width frame. And then I can sub in my O value that I know. And I can sub that in there and now everything on this side I know. Um, because I'm, this R times 0, 0, 1 is just bringing out the third column here. And so I have a bunch of constants in here. And so I can solve directly for my OC position, X, C, Y, C, and Z, C. It's just going to be my O minus D6 times my uh, Z, um, Z axis in that sixth frame. And you can see that here. We know where O6 is. That's the position of my end effector. And I'm just going to march backwards D6 to get to my wrist center. And that is kinematic decoupling. All right, so we have introduced today the idea of inverse kinematics. We've described why we want a closed form solution. And we've talked about the idea of kinematic decoupling and showing how we can isolate the orientation. All right, and solve for that wrist center. Now, what I'd like you to do I am away at IROS at one of the world's best robotics conferences, but I want to hear from you. Take three minutes and briefly send an email to me telling me what's the muddiest point that was addressed today, or, and what, you know, also tell me what you thought uh, was well done, because then I can uh, reply to these and, and help, the, help you guys understand this important